How do you take a structure from foundations in the ground to floor down, ready to enjoy? If you're building a deck this summer, this video is all for you. I'm Josh, a builder here in New Zealand, and we've partnered up with BCITO to better explain the building process. In this video here, I'll explain different elements of the subfloor. I'll help you understand the plans and stick around to the end of the video where I'll explain some of the common mistakes and how to avoid them. Remember, this is part two of a two-part series. If you haven't already, go and watch Piles and Poles. So your piles are in the ground, what's next? Two things, you're gonna run your bearers and then you're gonna run your joists. Each of these elements is all about taking the weight or the load and spreading it to the piles which spreads it to the ground. So whatever you're building, you wanna make sure that it can support what's going on top. Now there's tables in 3604, they'll tell you how thick, how strong your bearer needs to be depending on your pile spacing. Hopefully you've worked this all out before you started your piles. These will also be on the floor framing plan if you're doing a consented structure. So bearers sit on top of the piles. I like to install the piles and then use a laser level to cut them all to height. You now lay out your bearers. If you're laying multiple lines of bearers, make sure you stagger the join. Also note that joins are made directly above piles. Another thing is timber will always have a natural cantilever up or down, a bow. We eye up the timber, we put an arrow where the bow is facing, and then when you're building a floor structure, you always make sure the bow and the timber is going upwards, so as the load of the floor goes on it, it compresses down. Whereas if you put the bow downwards, it, all of that would act in reverse. Here you can see that the bearers get cut flush with the end of the piles, and you do this before you put any pile bracing hardware in. This would now be the perfect time to tie your bearers to your piles and make sure everything is nice and level. There's a bunch of different options for tying bearers to piles. You can find that out in 3604. Now you're ready to install joists. And the first thing I do is make sure that your heights are working. Can't reiterate enough, every step of the way, double check with your lines and your measurements so that when you get to lay that final layer, it just goes down and it all lines up and it's mint. A couple of tips, if your height's a little bit off, you can adjust under your joists. And this is really common. You're never gonna get it perfectly flat without a lot of work. Even just timber, there's a difference in the gauging of a couple of mils. So if your bearer is a couple of mils thicker and your joists a couple of mils thicker, you're going to end up with a buildup of plus or minus five mils. How do you resolve that? Well, you can plane out or chisel out a couple of mils out of the top of the bearer, take a couple of mils out of the joist. You could create a little timber shim, or if it's only a couple of mils, you can use packers, you can get pre-made packers, or you can use DPC, damp proof course. So not only are you checking the height, the next thing you need to do when you're installing joists is mark out your joist spacing with a line and an X and the line means that's the edge of the board and the X means that's where the board is sitting. Then you go to the other end of your structure and you mark that out and you make sure that in pencil, the spacing is working. It's real easy to get one of your measurements off and all of a sudden your joists end up on the piss. Once you've got the running measurement working at either end of the structure, you then use a chalk line to ping those lines on any intermediate bearers, the bearers in between. So you do that for your whole row of joists. Now you know where your joists need to sit on every single bearer and it's gonna be nice, straight, square, exactly what you need for that last layer to be mint. And when you're cutting your joists, you always make sure to put all of the bows upwards. Here's a top tip. I actually got taught to eye up the timber at the merchant's yard before we even put it on the trailer so that we knew that whatever we we're bringing back to build with was top quality. So in an ideal world, your joists would be long enough to do the full span. If you do need to join joists because you're trying to reuse timber or you're building a massive structure, you will need to do some joins. There's three ways to join. A flitch plate, a lapped join, or a nail plate join. Our preference for one reason or another seems to be the flitch plate. And what I like about a flitch plate is it keeps the line of the joist the same. Whereas in option B, the lapped join, your joist line, 
changes by 45 mils. Option C is you do a butt joint on top of the beret and you put a nail plate here. Again, I've used this sometimes. There's nothing wrong with this option. I just think I always end up leaning to option A because we've got leftover timber and I feel like it locks it up really nice. So you cut your joists to length and you tack them in place. Usually we just put one skew nail at either end, lay them out before you go gung-ho and lock everything in. Have a think about things about whether you need boundary joists, whether you need to double up for fixing, whether you're gonna put a balustrade, all of these things will affect in particular your boundaries. And then you can carry on and start fixing your joists in. As well as bearers, you might connect your joists to a stringer. Stringer beams are used where new floor framing connects to an existing floor or wall. The common use is constructing in a deck on an existing dwelling. So you have a row or two of bearers and then your last one into the house can often be a stringer. We use this on one of our jobs where a timber subfloor connected to a concrete slab. When building a deck, we often decide what's gonna be easier, a stringer or another row of piles. And this is definitely a situational thing. While you're laying here watching this video, I want you to think about one thing. Only 20% of viewers are subscribed to NZ Builder. Guys, what's going on? If you want me to keep making videos like this, go ahead, click subscribe. It really does help the channel out. So our joists are in and we're ready to start laying our decking. This is the most rewarding part. You wanna take your time and you wanna work out what's your starting point and also where are all your joins gonna go. And so with your joins, you've got two options. You can either come up with a pattern or you go for the haphazard random as weight. And believe it or not, this option also works and all the joins disappear as long as there's no visible pattern. Another important question, got to think about is your decking gonna go groove side up or groove side down? The age old argument. Personally, I love putting the groove side down. So decking's usually like 90 or 135 is two common sizes. And then you got to allow for a gap. Imagine you're allowing five mils. You work out your overall distance. It could be 3,600 divided by 95. And that gives you approximately how many boards you're gonna use. Why this is important is because you don't want a little slither of decking that you have to put at one end or the other, or you don't want to get to the end and all of a sudden you've had these perfect five mil gaps the whole way, and now you've got this 10 mil gap. This final layer and the way you fix it is how it gets seen forever, so make sure you come up with a bit of a plan of how it's all gonna get laid down. Again, just like sending out the joists, mark it out in pencil, have a think about it, adjust if needed. Another thing to remember is that if you're laying your decking and the timber is wet, it's going to shrink. But conversely, if the timber is bone dry, it's going to swell. Can't reiterate enough, real important to leave correct expansion gaps. Even a really robust timber like Quila will still expand in the wet. And then what happens is all of your water sits on top and it kind of amplifies the problem. I get that if you're using a pine in summer, those gaps end up shrinking and it looks like you've got 10 mil train tracks down there. So it is definitely a hard road finding the perfect gap. Depending on what I'm using, I usually aim for something between four and five mils as a good starting point. I'll use a nail, or we also sometimes use the camo tool, which has a four and a half mil spacer and pulls the boards in tight. So once you've laid out a section of decking, you're going to want to fix it off. Most likely you're either gonna be using nails or screws, and I've used both and for different situations. My very first project, I was a brand new homeowner, money was tight. I did everything manually, I used nails, I went for cheap and cheerful and individually punched every nail myself. When I did the section nobody wanted, I used the camo tool and the stainless steel screws with the hidden fixing system. So there's a bunch of options in between. But also the decking you choose will dictate the way you fix it and the intensity, for example, Quila, no matter what you're doing, you need to pre-drill every hole. But the biggest thing is no matter what, when you're doing your fixing, you want everything to be in a nice line. Take the time to mark where you're fixing before you drill and screw and whack in a nail because you don't want to be sitting on this mint thing you've built getting annoyed by your wobbly lines. If you're installing a subfloor for a structure, you're gonna most likely be using a flooring sheet such as strand board, particle board, 
or plywood. Back in the day, they used to use tongue and groove flooring that is now usually just a covering. And when you're building a structure, the top of the particle board will usually be what's called finished floor level. These boards will have grooves where a plastic tongue goes in and it locks both sheets up. That reduces any movement. When you are laying flooring sheets on a timber subfloor, use glue as well as screwing because the glue locks that all up and stops the squeaking. And like everything else we've talked about, you always stagger your joints. And remember that in wet areas, you need to use H3 flooring sheets. If you're building a deck this summer, here's three common mistakes and how to avoid them. Number one, incorrect joy spacing. For example, 21 mil pine decking cannot go on 600 mil center joists. You're gonna end up with a saggy, bouncy deck, or worse, someone will put their foot through the decking. That's not good. Do your research, get that right. Number two, forgetting about water. And in an ideal world, your deck would slope away from your building ever so slightly, so that if water does pond or pull on top of it, it drains away from your house or your structure, not into your house or your structure. Remember that as it gets wet, timber swells, gaps become tight, and then there's nowhere for the water to go. Have a think about that before you lay your final covering. And number three, using incorrect fixings or hardware, even if you're on a budget and you're gonna nail it off yourself, make sure you use good nails that are going to hold the timber in. Something like an annular groove with a decent head on it is going to mean that it holds your decking in and locks it tight. Make sure you think about things like corrosion. Most likely you're gonna to need to use stainless steel fixings. I know that it costs a lot, but again, you've got this far, you've done everything right. Use the appropriate fixings. Also think about the finished look of your fixings because that might influence what you go for or not go for. I've made a video on the camo tool. I really love it. Go and check that out. Thank you.